Hey there and welcome to my channel and if you're already a subscriber, thank you so much for coming back. So today I'm going to be talking about the six best side gig apps for women in 2022. Disclaimer, obviously anyone can do these gigs, not just women, but because of the nature of the jobs for most of them, they do tend to be more popular with women. I've done all six of them at some point in my life since 2014. So I am going to leave you with pros and cons for each one of them. So let's get started. Back in 2014, Nora was fresh out of college, living in Denver, Colorado, and looking for flexible, somewhat easy, high earning potential side gigs because I started pursuing acting professionally around that time. Of course, I dabbled in a lot of nine to five jobs for a couple of years, but at the same time, I was also doing side gigs and a lot of them were through these apps that I'm about to share with you. All right, so number one is Urban Sitter. If you haven't heard of Urban Sitter, it is an app that is an on-demand platform that basically connects parents with available babysitters that have been highly vetted. They have passed background checks. Um, they have good ratings and they are available for you to hire on a last minute whim or scheduled in advance. It is a woman owned business and it's very good in my opinion. So how do you get started on it? You basically create a profile listing your caregiving experience, um, any other certifications that you have, and then on the app, you go onto their calendar and you basically fill out when you're available and when you're not available so that potential parents, when they're looking through profiles, can determine if you're available for a date night or whatever they do, uh, have to go to work or, you know, any of those reasons why you hire a babysitter, if you're available and then they determine if they want to hire you. As well, you get to pick your own rate. And then when you're accepted, you basically just browse the app for open jobs, apply to them, or you'll just have parents reach out to you if they think that you're a fit. I think one of the things that set me apart when I was doing Urban Sitter back in 2017 in Denver was that I speak Spanish and a lot of parents like the idea of somebody being bilingual around their child even though you don't really get much time to talk to them or teach them Spanish because kids are kids um, and you only really get to interact with the majority of them like once. Unless you're a repeat sitter, which did happen for myself on a couple of occasions, but a lot of times it won't, or you might decide that it's really not a good fit. Not really because of the child themselves most of the time, but because parents can be pretty weird. So the average pay um, that I made back in 2017, 2018 was around $20 an hour. Some parents would tip, but a lot of them don't. And you do get to keep 100% of what you make. Urban Sitter claims that they don't take anything, but do know that you are going to be basically in a new environment every single time or most of the time that you are showing up for babysitting jobs. So you could have a newborn all the way to an 11 year old who just is interested in skateboarding. It really depends. It can be a pretty chill job. <laughs> you might end up eating a lot of pizza with, you know, kids and, um, that can be nice. A lot of times the little ones will take naps, so you have basically free time. So the pros of Urban Sitter are that you really can make pretty good money depending on how many jobs you take on. Urban Sitter advertises that sitters can make up to $1,000 per week. Yes, you definitely can. It's very flexible. It can be chill, pretty easy to navigate set up your calendar and reach out to Urban Sitter if you have any issues. Cons. For me, sometimes 
Dealing with other people's kids, especially kids and parents that you haven't had a chance to meet or build trust um, can be overwhelming. So it can be something where it's too much responsibility and it's kind of scary. Some parents and children are pretty weird. I had an experience with these two parents who hired me because they needed somebody to babysit their five-year-old daughter while they went off and did some activities um, in Denver because it was the mom's birthday and they were not from Denver, they were from out of state. So I arrive, they didn't really have any food in the fridge, they didn't really leave any directions on like what the five-year-old ate if she was, you know, supposed to take a nap. And this was like over 10 hours, kind of middle of the day all the way into the night. So the only instructions were to put her to bed and then that's around the time that they would come back. Super cute girl, very sweet. We watched movies. Then I got hungry and I'm like, wait a minute, what am I supposed to eat? So I ended up ordering food for both of us because I'm not a cheap ass and kids need to eat. Um, and also she was hungry. And so I ordered, you know, some I think chicken nuggets or macaroni and cheese or something. And then when it came time to put her to bed, I kept receiving messages from the parents asking me if I had put her to bed. And I was like, you know, we're reading a story and uh, no, she hasn't fallen asleep yet, but we're in the process. And then every like two minutes, they kept asking, okay, is she asleep now? Is she asleep now? Is she asleep now? It's like, no. And then the little girl started crying. <sighs> So that's another like 10 minutes of you just trying to console her and you know, make sure that she goes to bed. But she was crying because children cry, especially when they're tired and they are home with a stranger and their parents are the ones that put the child to bed. And so a couple of minutes go by and then they start texting again, like, hey, please let us know as soon as she's asleep so we can come back. It's like, <laughs> what? And that kept going and going and she was, by this time she was just scream crying and i called them and finally i was like no like she will not go to sleep unless she sees you because she's crying for you and eventually the dad came back in and i i wondered if they were you know parked outside somewhere just waiting for her to go to sleep and they kept saying as soon as she falls asleep you can go you can go like and i was like do they not want to pay me extra what it was it was really strange so i got out of there as soon as they came back and they ended up rating me pretty unfairly so yeah it was a weird situation and of course it's not really a con it's just it comes with the territory you are gonna have to potentially clean up dirty poopy diapers and vomit uh and deal with snot and crying babies and all of that stuff that comes with the job. <laughs> so if you are somebody who is not a caregiver or likes children, um, this is not for you. And again, some readings can be a little unfair, even if you did like the best job. There are still some parents who think that, you know, ratings don't affect you and those are entitled people. Okay, moving on. Number two, hop, skip, drive. Hop Skip Drive started in California in 2016 and serves as a ride-sharing service for minors under 18. And it provides them with on-demand and scheduled rides to and from school, to their outside activities or other destinations that are scheduled by their parents or by the school. And so both families and schools can take advantage of this and provide safe and convenient rides for kids. Sometimes kids will live in an area that does not provide a bus route for them to get to school. So this is definitely um, an app that filled that gap and also Uber and Lyft cannot pick up anyone that's under 18. Um, so that also filled that gap. So how do you get started with Hop Skip Drive? It's pretty intense. 
as it should be because you're dealing with kids. I did Hop Skip Drive back in 2018 in Denver and at the time I, I believe it was only available for the Front Range Denver area in Colorado, Southern California, and I think the Bay Area. And now they've added a couple of more cities and states but it's not available nationwide. I believe right now it's only offered in Southern California, San Francisco Bay Area, as I mentioned Front Range, Denver area in Colorado, Austin, Houston, Virginia DC area, Dallas, Fort Worth, Arizona, Seattle, Spokane, Las Vegas, Midland, Milwaukee, Madison, and I think that's it. Um, so <laughs> like I mentioned these are some of the qualifications that you have to have and also you're gonna have to participate in other ones once you pass a couple of hurdles, I guess. You have to go through a 19 point vehicle inspection with a certified mechanic, five years of caregiving experience, you have to adopt the hop skip rules, which is kind of intense. You have to be 23 years or older. You do an in-person meeting with the representatives of hop skip drive. You have to do fingerprints and ongoing background checks. Good driving record, in-person orientation, no criminal record. <laughs> county, state, federal, everywhere the driver has lived for the last seven years, no sex offenders, you need personal auto insurance coverage, valid license, a vehicle that's 10 years old or newer for four to seven passengers, um, of course zero tolerance for illegal mobile usage with a passenger in the car, and zero tolerance for smoking drugs, alcohol while driving, of course. <laughs> So like I said, it is a very highly selective application process and it takes a little bit to get all of that sorted before you get started. However, you can make pretty good money with Hop Skip Drive. I think I made an average of like $35 an hour, but I know some people who make 60 an hour. Um, I know they, they have bonuses all of the time and it's definitely on the higher end of ride sharing apps. So you set your own schedule, you go on the app, you are able to claim jobs or able to have them scheduled for you to accept. I don't really know how the process is now because everything changes so quickly so you'll have to double check on that. If you're someone that does Uber or Lyft and you're tired of driving adults around then this would be a really good alternative. So with that, what are the pros and cons? Pros of doing hop skip drive is the potential for really good money. The flexible schedule, you don't have to deal with creepy, drunk, sexist, racist, you name it, adults. And you get to help out kids with something that's really important is getting them, you know, to school and back safely. It warms my heart. The cons. It can be pretty inconsistent. The flexible schedule um, at a point can become a little bit unreliable, like to the point where it's not so easy to cancel last minute because it is really important to have rides that are guaranteed for these kids. Parents can be a little bit weird. Kids can be a little bit weird, some of them and it can be too much responsibility. You are literally tracked from point A to point B by hop, skip, drive, and parents know where you're at and they get updates, which is not a bad thing because you are dealing with kids, I understand. But it might make you feel a little bit weird. Um, it did for me, especially because they start kind of harassing you if you're a little bit late for the estimated pickup time and the estimated drop-off time. When they don't understand that when you are driving to a school at peak school time, so that's before classes start and then after classes end, it can be really hectic. You have lines of cars from parents and others that are trying to pick up or drop off their kids. Depending on what school you're at too, you also have traffic trying to park or get out. It can be really hectic. So just dealing with navigating a school that you have no idea. You don't know what kind of policies they have on where you can park and not park because you don't go there. You're not a parent. 
they don't do a very good job of telling you that. The directions are kind of bad as well because you might have someone who took the time to say, pick up my child over here, and then you'll go over there and they're not there, but then they do show up like five minutes later. So you can't control those things. As well, you also get a report each week um, showing how many rides you conducted, how many you were late for, and safety. And the safety is the weird part. So they will show a record of you speeding or not speeding, and this could be you going over two miles of the speed limit, it doesn't matter, or if you did any hard braking. So yeah, all the rides are monitored to the T. And again, I get it because it is, it's kids you're dealing with. That part really got to me and eventually I, I had to stop doing it because it's it was just too much responsibility for myself, but I could see how people really love to do it. And the other con is the car maintenance and the gas that you're gonna have to spend money on because they don't give you any money for that. Number three, Jive. Oh, how I miss you, Jive. I wish you were in New Mexico. The same as when you were in Denver. So I did Jive back in 2017, 2018, and I have to say it was one of my favorite gigs ever. Yes, of course, it has a couple of cons, but um, overall, I really liked it. So Jive is a platform that connects brands and retailers with independent contractors. They called them brand ambassadors, but really you were a merchandiser that was stocking merchandise for uh, Kehi distributors and Kehi does I think that's how you pronounce it. It's one of the nation's top wholesale food distributors that has a natural, organic specialty and fresh brands and products that go into stores. So any of your Amy's, <laughs> that's the only one I can think of. <laughs> Amy's, that's the only one. No, you know, there's a lot more. I. Not think of anymore. But yes, they partner with grocery stores and I know a lot of um, Kehi products are in Sprouts, uh, Whole Foods, Safeway, Albertsons, Smith's, Kroger, you know, a lot of them. So for Denver, they had a partnership with Safeway that is similar to Albertsons. And you basically, after you sign up for Jive, and you go through a background check and the application process, you get contacted by a recruiter or an area rep who then schedules an in-person orientation. And that was a really nice part. I don't know if they, they do that now, but back then mine was scheduled for a Safeway in Denver. I showed up. They tell you what to bring. So a box cutter, basically. And you got to train a little bit with other potential drivers and they explained everything, did a couple of, you know, stocking examples with you. And then you got to use the baler in the back, which is the very dangerous big thing that crushes the boxes. Yeah, just kind of show you the ropes. And so that was great because not a lot of apps or, you know, um, these gigs do that. After you do all of that, you download the app and you're able to claim jobs. At the time, you had to claim the jobs early in the morning for like the next day. I don't know if it was the next two days. You'll have to look into that. Um, but basically you claim jobs for the next day or the next couple of days. And you got to see on the app has a map and it'll show like basically the safe ways and like when they were scheduled to be delivered. And it would have like the amount of units. You would know how big it was, what they were paying you and the estimated time that the job was to be completed. So after you claimed a job or two, you show up, you let a store manager know you're there, which most of the time they didn't really care. You go in the back, you're technically kind of a vendor. Um, you found the Kehi pallets. You physically had to move them and put them, you know, in a cart. You roll it out onto the floor and then you just start stocking it and it would give you aisles for most of them. Some of them you had no idea where they were. In the first couple of jobs, I would say were kind of hard because 
you spent more time than was estimated because you're new. You don't know where things are or how they're organized in the store. But if you stuck to it, like I did, eventually you learned where everything was and you got pretty fast at it and you completed jobs in less time, meaning that you were able to make more money. The nice thing about Jive was that they also had bonuses because a lot of people, <laughs> ironically, a lot of the men in my area would drop the jobs and they're pretty labor intensive. And so I would see a lot of women doing jives and like I did it for over a year and I loved it. Um, but anyways, once they dropped them, you were able to claim them. Um, and they also gave really nice incentives and promos for the, the jobs. Sometimes like over a hundred dollars for something that would take me like two hours to complete. And it was anything from dairy to frozen items to um, dry products, never produce. And I really liked getting to know or getting to see the different brands of foods and just like stocking things and um, being by myself and having <laughs> having customers stop me and ask where something was and it was really nice telling them that I didn't work there. Because I didn't, technically, I did not work there. I don't know, I just thought it was funny. But anyways, it is a very labor intensive job. You get a lot of free, weight lift training and you walk a lot you're on your feet you might be on your knees not like that and um you have to push things around carry really heavy items stuff like that and you also document each step you'll have the app tell you what to do it'll be locate this there and put it here and then at the end if you have extra of the product you put it neatly in a box and you label it yes kiki i'm doing a video okay yes i know i know so you take pictures of it and you make sure that the Kehi rep knows where it's at and can deal with that. I don't really know what they did. But anyways, I made like eventually after learning the aisles and, and how everything worked, I made a, around $25 per hour. Um, and I would have a pretty part-time week and I would I wanna say I made around 700 a week pretty part-time and it was very flexible. I had to show up that day, but the time that I showed up really depended on when the truck was there and when I kind of wanted to show up. So it wasn't super early. Although I know some people did show up early if the truck was there, but um, that was nice. So the pros, free weightlifting, the potential to make pretty good money with all of the bonuses, very flexible, not much interaction with people, you got to work different Safeways or stores. Um, if you are in Denver, it would be Safeway. The Jive customer service was pretty helpful. Your local rep was pretty helpful. And you're not really driving that much because you're spending the majority of the time at the store. So that's nice if you're concerned about, you know, the, the maintenance and the damage that your car is going to take on with all of these different apps. The cons. It could be very unreliable. Um, I mean, you were basically competing for open jobs every single morning and you had to be the fastest one to click on it. And that just seems really dystopian to me. It's very labor intensive, meaning that if you have injuries, there's, there's no way that you should even be doing this job. It could be dangerous for yourself. And it's not available in every single state. Boo. Number four, shipped. Shipt is another really good app and it's one that I currently do part-time. So you have to be at least 18 years or older, uh, have a driver's license, auto insurance, a car, a reliable vehicle that's, you know, 1997 or newer, uh, knowledge of the produce, selection, ability to lift 40 pounds, sometimes more, have an iPhone that is newer or android that is newer pass a background check and yeah uh shipped you can make it depends on the metro because i know that some people who are in bigger busier metros such as like the bay area or even florida they make a 
ridiculous amount of money. I know one lady on the Ship Shopper Lounge that's on Facebook, um, she was saying that in the Bay Area, she made a couple of thousand dollars per week. And it really depends on who the customers are and how much money they basically tip you. Because the majority of your money is gonna come from tips. Um, and I know here in Albuquerque, man, I average anywhere from 20 to $30 an hour and it really depends. And it does help that they came out with new features such as preferred shoppers, preferred members. So that means that you are most likely gonna get your regulars who you know will tip, they know who you are. So it's a better experience. Shipt is owned by Target now, so a lot of the orders are going to be for Target shops, which is awesome because I love Target and it's going to be organized by the aisles, which is awesome. It saves you more time. Shipt, in my opinion, is better than Instacart and I tried Instacart. What makes it better than Instacart, in my opinion, is that it's more of a personal shopping experience. Customers are more communicative and you're able to connect with them on like a human level more than Instacart. And they tend to be more elite. Man, I don't want to use that word. And they tend to tip you more than Instacart because I think it's, it's just more of a personal shopping experience. You can schedule whenever you want, every single day, at every hour. You can be on, you can be off, and you can drop or cancel orders if you know you're running late or you just did not feel like doing it or you recognize that the customer is a shitty tipper or shitty customer. And the shipped customer service is pretty helpful. You can reach them via chat or you can call them. Bonuses happen pretty frequently and they have become better about like their rating system. So yes, it can be pretty fun to, to shop for people. Pros, it's very flexible, extremely flexible, like I mentioned. You do have the potential to make some pretty good money, more than Instacart and the other delivery apps, and people can be pretty generous and most of the time pretty nice. It's good exercise, um, and the drop-offs are awesome because you have little to no interaction with people, <laughs> which is pretty great. Cons. Car maintenance, whoo, you're gonna be driving a lot. I had an experience here in New Mexico where I literally fell into a canal under a bridge. I'm not gonna talk about how it happened. All I'm gonna say is that if it wasn't for my friend Matt, thank you Matt, my car would have still been stuck there in the sand, never to be seen, because eventually it would have been stolen by someone in Albuquerque. Which is fine, whatever, everybody needs to work. Everyone needs to hustle. But you'll know when they start hiring new people and those new people will get first pick on orders because that's just how shipped does things and you'll start getting less and less orders and then it'll pick up again and then it'll go back down. So it's really unreliable, which is nice that they came out with the preferred shoppers, preferred members for the reason that you'll still get those orders coming through. You'll have people who just won't ever tip you and you'll you'll be making, you know, anywhere from seven, eight dollars, eleven dollars and then no tip for an order that took you like an hour to do. And that can be really discouraging. You can get deactivated for a number of reasons with like little to no warning, but usually you know if you're doing bad. Stores may not have all of the items and customers can be not so nice about it. Although this is pretty rare, it's only happened to me a couple of times. And then some customers might not even wanna interact with you and that drives me nuts and it might make you late for another order or like you'll risk having a bad rating which is not good i i hate ratings i know that they're good for a lot of things to measure different metrics but the way that they're laid out for a lot of these apps is really unfair and it's easy to get burnt out but i love shipped number five this is gonna be talking about house cleaning i love to clean Number five is going to be Homaglow, formerly known as Homejoy. 
Home Joy is what I started out doing back in 2014. And Home Joy was an app that connected cleaners, professional cleaners, with members who needed a cleaner to clean their home or apartment. And back in 2014, when I was in Boulder, Colorado, this was my first experience with an app. The nice thing about Homejoy is that they invested money into your cleaning kit. And I wanna say this was valued at probably $200 because it included a bunch of cleaning supplies and a vacuum and a cart to put all of your stuff in. And then they also had reps um, who made sure that you went through like a cleaning orientation kind of training. So that was nice because you got to ask questions and I think everybody was in a similar situation where it was 2014 and, and like the gig economy was just kind of starting. So people were still a little bit skeptical about all of this, but Anyways, Homejoy ended up failing for different reasons. So then after Homejoy failed, I believe it was 2016, I think, when I got an email from Homeaglow um, telling me that I was one of their top rated cleaners and inviting me onto their new platform. And at the time, you know, I had a full-time job, but I said, yeah, why not? I'm gonna see where this goes, have some extra money and save, sure. And I still had a lot of the cleaning products, the vacuum and the cart really, from Homejoy. And I said, sure. The platform was a little bit better because I remember Homejoy was all over the place and the members were really weird and sketchy and they rated you very unfairly. But then you also got to rate your experience and kind of write a description about each member and each job that you completed so that other professional cleaners would be able to know what happened if they were cleaning that person's home. So that was kind of nice. Um, but Home Aglow, I don't believe had that. It's been such a long time that I don't remember. With Home Aglow, I think my rate was, I wanna say 25 an hour. I think I, I got a lot of tips. For the most part, I think I always got a tip, which is really nice. It was anywhere from like 20 to $40, but it really depended. The jobs themselves, they ranged anywhere from a two hour job to like a six hour job. And you either did a couple of them in a day or you did just one in a day. And home aglow with them, if you did a job with somebody and they rated you and they tipped you, they could request you to come back and do like a weekly or bi-weekly or once a month type of deal. And so you could accept that. The flexibility was good. Cleaning is fun for a lot of people. Most members were nice. I would say 50% of the time they were home. 50% of the time they just let, let you go into their home and, and you know, left directions are key. And money could be great. Pros, flexibility, Cleaning can be fun, people can be cool, you're left alone for the most part, and money could be great. Cons, people can be creepy assholes. Fucking probably prejudiced and racist as well. No, they can be. I had a couple of situations where I was patronized, I was looked down on. There's still that stereotype, still that stereotype. They make the job uncomfortable especially when they stayed at home. I understand that a lot of people don't trust having strangers in their home, but then again, why don't you clean the fucking house yourself then? If you're gonna be at home, just like breathing down our necks. Also, you know that a lot of people, they had background checks done on them. You do have to invest like ongoing money to keep up your cleaning products keep restocking your cleaning products. So that's that's another downside. The rescheduling can be annoying, especially if you're somebody who just really wants true flexibility whenever. Turn it on, turn it off, that's it. But you could have potentially ongoing appointments and that can be not so ideal, especially if you're somebody who just doesn't know what your schedule is gonna look like day by day. Customer service was not that helpful or friendly sympathetic. They do monitor your text messages 
to make sure that you're not potentially stealing their clients offline, which I really wouldn't blame you if you did. Because they take a lot of money. They take a percentage out of what your rate is and then they charge the client even more. And then when you realize that the client could have paid you that to begin with because they're already paying them, um, yeah, I totally understand why you would want to take those clients, especially if you've built that trust with them. I think Homeaglow does a really poor job of setting up expectations with clients because a lot of the time, majority of the time, you would accept a job for say like a two hour cleaning and then you realize when you got there that they expected you to basically do a deep cleaning of like a two bedroom, two bath house in two hours, which a lot of you out there who are professional cleaners know that's impossible. And so then you looked like the bad person when you explained to them that that's not realistic and you risk having a bad score or rating from them. And again, they have that whole rating system as well, which I think is pretty unfair. And it just creates like a high stress situation, which is not good. Lastly, number six, Handy. Basically a similar platform to Homeaglow. Basically a similar application process. Um, you have to have knowledge and experience uh, about cleaning professionally, pass a background check, and invest in cleaning supplies because they don't pay for anything. You don't set your own rates. You kind of go off of a tier system that they have depending on the metro and area that you're in. Here in Albuquerque, I did it for a little bit and I made anywhere from 19 to 21 an hour plus some time tip. And actually a lot of people did tip, so that was nice. You choose the jobs based on when they're offered. It's not really like a scheduling thing. It could have changed though. I haven't done it since 2019. Clients rate you again, and Handy can also charge you penalty fees for anything from running late, canceling last minute, or leaving too early. And they share everything with you, so there are no surprises. Pros, flexibility is okay. The cleaning can be fun. Again, some people are nice. They'll leave you alone. They'll trust you. They'll tip. Cons, I think it's not the best paying cleaning app out there. It takes too much. The penalty fees are kind of bizarre. The customer service is even worse. It's really hard to get a hold of anyone. The ratings, you have to invest in your cleaning kit all the time. You again might have creeps or weirdos. I had a situation <laughs> with this woman who I was cleaning and we kind of, we became friendly in what you would consider as friendly goes with a house cleaner and home owner does. But anyways, she was a really good tipper, but she started becoming very odd. I cleaned for her for a couple of months and one day I got there, usual, and uh, part of the cleaning was cleaning her bedroom and she was asleep in her bed with the lights off at 4 p.m. So what would you do in that situation? You would leave her alone, right? I was in between <laughs> coughing or <laughs> turning the light on or <laughs> um, whispering her name or like doing anything. Like, what do you do? Like, do you just, hey, wake up, <laughs> like I'm cleaning. Um, or just start cleaning, you know, turn the vacuum on. Like, I don't know, I was like, maybe she's sick. So then I skipped that area. I cleaned her restroom, which was in the bedroom. I left. The next cleaning appointment, similar story, the same. The one after that, I asked myself, maybe she's tired. I don't know, maybe she's sick. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask her if she wants to reschedule. So we did the same shit. But this time she complained that I wasn't cleaning her bedroom. And I was like, no shit, like you're fucking sleeping. Something was really off. And in my gut, I was like, you know, this isn't worth it. I'm, I'm out of here. 
they have, because it was a couple, it wasn't just her, it was her and her boyfriend. They were very odd. They kind of stopped, besides that weird, bizarre situation, they kind of stopped like talking to me. And so I just followed my gut feeling and I, I respectfully told them that it just wasn't working out. Even though I had been cleaning for like an hour, I was like, don't, don't pay me, but I, I'm gonna go. Um, this is not a good fit. And that was so awkward. Um, so I don't know if she ever got up from that bed, basically. So besides that, depending on what metro you're in, you might not even have enough jobs. So that's it. Those are the six best side gig apps for women in 2022. And I'm sure all of them have had some improvement. Um, you will have to do that investigating and research on your own time. But I definitely can vouch for each and every one of them and say that it is a really great way to make a part-time or even full-time income off of them. I would encourage you to always have a couple of different apps going or side gigs going because you don't want to depend on just one and you never know if you're going to be deactivated for any reason. My favorite out of the six would probably have to be Jive. Oh, I wish that Jive were in New Mexico in the same capacity as it is in Denver, but it's not. My second would have to be Shipped, and that is um, a gig that I am still doing pretty part-time here in Albuquerque, and I really enjoy it. If you are in a bigger metro area, definitely check out all of these. So with that, Thank you so much and subscribe if you are interested in any of these subjects. Um, I do post a little bit of everything, um, so it's never going to be similar. You can really support this very, very, very small channel just by liking this video. Share it, subscribe, do whatever you want to do. I won't tell you what to do. And if you are interested in Shipped, I do have a whole video um, in my channel. Basically, it's the guide to ship shopping in 2022. That's what it's called too. And um, check it out if you are interested in shipped and want to know what it's all about. All right, bye.